In this episode, I talk with Tina Rasmussen, PhD, a meditation teacher and author who's best known as being the first Western woman to master the virtuoso level shamatha meditation system of Paok Seyadol. In this interview, we learn about Tina's life-defining quest for enlightenment that inspired her one-year solar retreat, in which her practice of Dzogchen triggered not only massive energetic phenomena, but also a profound spiritual awakening. We hear about Tina's training and authorization under the notoriously rigorous meditation master Paok Seyadol, culminating in mastery of all eight jhanas with all ten casinas and much more. We also discuss issues such as integration of awakening in working life, romantic relationship after enlightenment, and sexual scandal among meditation teachers. And so, without further ado, Tina Rasmussen. Tina, thank you for uh, joining me on the podcast. You're very welcome, Steve. And you've had a really remarkable career of practice uh, in meditation. And I'm curious, how did you first become interested in meditation? Yeah, well, I was um, very fortunate that at the age of 13, at the Methodist church that my parents and I went to, there was a family day. And um, my story is that the person doing that session that I went to on the family day had, you know, this was in the 70s. And I imagine that he came back from Asia or India somewhere and was sharing what he learned, probably hippie, you know. I just wandered in and my parents were off doing something else. I don't even know where they were. And um, I sat down in the pew and I learned meditation. And I went off at the age of 13 and started meditating, you know, mostly like before bed to relax because sometimes being a teenager is a little stressful. <laughs> and, um, and so I just started using it at night. And I didn't really learn about meditation until I was in my 20s, but I'd been doing it fairly often on and off um, as a young person. So that's how I got interested. <laughs> What was the technique that he taught you? It was a body scan type meditation. So, you know, that's fairly common in a lot of traditions. It's, you know, kind of, I haven't been to a Goenka retreat, from, but from what I hear, it's similar to that or, or mindfulness of the body that's um, very common in, in Buddhism. Yeah, I've interviewed several people from that generation. They sort of, you know, dropped out, took the overland through Afghanistan and whatever is the case and ended up in Dharamsala or wherever the case may be. This, this, there was quite a cadre of, of those people, wasn't there? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So they, you know, I don't even know who to thank. I don't even know what his name was, but um, he certainly had an influence on me. So, you know, that's good for all of us to remember that some small thing that we did that we barely remember could have had a, a huge life impact on somebody else that was positive. So if he's out there, thank you. <laughs> yeah. And what came next in terms of your own uh, journey, either biographically or in terms of meditation? Yeah, then in my 20s, um, kind of mid to late 20s, I got very interested in the spiritual path and um, started, uh, I lived in Santa Barbara at the time and I worked right across from the library and um, I was divorced from my first husband and so that sort of opened up a new stage of life for me. And um, I just started like devouring spiritual books from all different traditions. I'd go to the library, I'd just go down the aisles and pull out a book and read it. And um, I just couldn't get enough, really. And then I started experimenting with different traditions, different practices, and eventually landed in a, um, in a Buddhist retreat with Jack Cornfield. And I think it was a weekend at, um, maybe at Mount Madonna, near in the Bay Area here where I live. Didn't live here then, but, um, and that was when I really got hooked on Buddhist meditation retreats. And so I started doing more and more of those and um, longer ones <clears throat> and um, was also practicing yoga and studying with non-dual teachers in my 30s. And, um, but really doing the long meditation retreats that went to 10 days and then month longs. And then I started doing month long almost every year. And um, 
So that was sort of the trajectory at that point. And then in my later 30s, I kind of realized that in a, from a worldly standpoint, I've kind of done most of the things that I'd aspired to do as a person. You know, I, I had work that I loved. I'd had relationships that were satisfying. Um, I'd had a book published. Um, and I really realized that I didn't want to just keep repeating that, doing more and better for the rest of my life, that I really wanted to go deep on the spiritual path. And I had a teacher who had done a, a long, year-long solo retreat who inspired me to think about doing that. And so for my, it was between my 39 and 40, I did the year. And I did, so I did a year-long solo retreat um, which, you know, now I, I think about that, people ask me about it frequently, and I, I just go, wow, how did I do that? You know, <laughs> I mean, it was it's pretty intense, really, when you when I look back at it. But I just was so, I had such a burn for awakening, and that, that drive was so strong. It, it, like, didn't matter what happened, really. My worst fear was that I might become mentally unbalanced, um, I might not be able to function. I might end up homeless. You know, all these things were part of it. And I had to give up my clients and I had a mortgage. I owned a small condominium in the Bay Area. So it was fairly risky to do that. I, you know, I wasn't from a wealthy family or anything. And, um, but I just really f could feel this pull and that there, it was like close by that sense of really understanding the mystery at a different level and you know what the human experience is and what's below the personality and the and the body in terms of knowing myself what i am that's fascinating and I'd, you've covered an awful lot of ground there and i'd like to ask you about quite a bit of that ground and also what happened sure. beyond that but what was it initially do you think about that period in santa barbara what was it do you think that at the retreat you did with Jack Cornfield that so hooked you or so interested you about that t kind of meditation? Maybe you could also mention maybe a little bit about the type of meditation that you were doing at that time. Yeah, well, I was, I've always been fairly um, broad in my practices. I mean, I really went deep within Buddhism, um, but I've also practiced in the Hindu tradition and was interested in A Course in Miracles for a point, you know, period of time. But really, it, it got more and more focused on the um, intensive Buddhist meditation over the years, and that's where I really found a home. Um, I well, I I think what was happening, and I see this in my own students now all the time, is that I was getting tastes of um, non-duality, getting tastes of my deeper nature, and it was so compelling even just small tastes like that were so compelling that I just wanted more, you know? And I, I had a faculty for the practice that I didn't know at the time was unusual, um, but I'd go to these retreats and I would just like within days, I'd be totally with my object of meditation without breaks and I'd be in a blissful state. And, you know, of course, there's personality material that comes up that's hard to work with that also was happening, but I wasn't really having trouble um, doing the practice. So um, there were a lot of times when I was relatively free of um, suffering. And I just, I, I could see that with the teachings, there was the potential to live from that more and more. So that's what was compelling to me. I was mostly doing Vipassana at that time. So that was the main practice I was doing on those long retreats. And then um, there was a group of us that were invited to start doing concentration practice kind of like off to the side. You know, there'd be a hundred Vipassana practitioners. And then there was this little group of those of us getting private instruction on concentration. And that's really from Guy Armstrong. He was the one that really started introducing that and experimenting with it. And he was my main teacher at the time at Spirit Rock. And um, so then I started doing concentration practice as well. 
from what from what tradition was he drawing that or from what uh, lineages if you will he, that was from Theravadan Buddhism, and it was at the time they were mainly, and I think this might still be true, but they were mainly teaching concentration with the Brahma Viharas, with the you know loving kindness, joy, compassion, equanimity practices of Buddhism that are very specific, and so that's what um, I the practice was mainly metta, loving kindness that I would be doing when I was doing the intensive concentration practice. And, you know, at that time in your life, and also I believe at this time, or at least quite recently, you had a very busy and successful career in business. And you've published three business books and you obtained a PhD. When you started to access, in a certain sense, this non-dual state that you're describing, and you started to have a glimpse of a different way of operating, um, what was it like at that time when you were, in a certain sense, I presume, straddling both ways of operating in a high-powered business and also then these these deep, uh, rarefied states of, or beginning to anyway, at least beginning to glimpse and taste these rarefied meditational states? Yeah, um, well, it's been a journey and, you know, I feel that this is part of what I have to offer is that... Um, I have straddled and I continue to straddle both worlds, even now. And um, gosh, it was so hard at the beginning because I didn't even tell people. I, you know, I felt kind of closeted at the beginning. It wasn't accepted the way it is now where everybody knows in, about meditation is so mainstream. So um, that was the beginning. And then eventually I did start telling people and they accepted it or they didn't. But I, you know, was uncloseted um, but you know I'd go on these retreats and I'd come back and I was so open and so sensitive that I'd like go to the grocery store and it would hurt I mean physically and I wasn't it wasn't integrated very well and, and then I'd have a transition period where um, I'd kind of resurface and reconstitute somewhat so that I could be a normal person and then I go into the business world. At the time, I was doing a lot of diversity work, diversity inclusion work, which is extremely taxing, especially back then. I mean, I'm not, I don't think it's any easier now, actually. But um, so, but I think the spiritual depth that I had, that was like a growing sense of continuity of that, um, really helped me do such intense, difficult work for. 10 or 15 years and also working with senior executives. I mean, I look at it now and I was like in my twenties and thirties and I was basically back then there wasn't a thing called executive coaching, but I was doing that with people much older than me. And I think that my spiritual practice really allowed for me to have a compassion for everybody, no matter where they were in the spectrum, but also to try and work with them in a way that, um, I could be effective and, and um, help. I've really been a change agent. That's really what I am, both in the business world and spiritually. And um, But it was hard on me. They were really two separate worlds. And over the years, they've gotten much more to where I don't feel there's any separation between any parts of my life anymore. You know, But that has been a long journey, a long journey. and. Um, I think the world needs it, and that's why there are so many of us that are choosing that instead of going off and sort of leaving the world the way, you know, historically that's what you did. If you had a serious spiritual path, you became a monastic or, you know, there were a few traditions like Tibetan Buddhism where you could be a cave yogi and not be a monastic, but there weren't a lot of options, and, and now there are, which is really wonderful. Why was it so useful or important for you when you were finally able to tell people about your your passion for meditation and spiritual things why why did that create such a relief because for instance you know many many people are passionate about things in their if you want non-professional life and in a certain sense don't think to cross them over so you mentioned in your 20s and 30s you know when you started to talk more about it it was it helped a great deal and i'm curious as to as to why that was yeah well, that's a really good question. Um, I think it's because this to me is different than like a hobby. I mean, maybe at some point I saw it as a hobby, you know, at first 
I don't think I ever saw it as a hobby, actually. Um, it's not like fishing, you know, it's not like gardening, although one can definitely have a presence and do that with a lot of attention. Yeah, like this is about who, for me, like who and what I am as a human being, as a person. And um, so I think for me, the way it helped was that it helped me integrate, you know, if I can't even tell people, then my worlds are never going to be together. And um, so I think it was really more for me to be who I am and um, not be hiding, you know, like I use the word closeted. Why is it important for a person, you know, a gay person, a lesbian person to come out, somebody with something that's different because it's who they are, you know, there's an integration that's possible. So, I mean, I'm not comparing it to that exactly, but that's, I guess, how I felt was that I could be myself more in that, that integration of not having to, like internally, also giving myself permission to bring that into all of my life instead of separating them. I think that's what I'd done before was internally, I had separated them out and that's how I dealt with it. But, you know, at some point, it's so much a part of who a person is, at least for me, that I couldn't really keep doing that, which was good. Which is good. What do you mean by that? Well, I think it was good because, um, like, I've had clients who've been interested in the spiritual path because of me. Like, they, they get that I bring a certain kind of um, calm and presence two things and they are curious about it but i think it's really more that i can bring all of who i am or more of who i am to those settings and it actually makes a difference in those settings i'm curious then i'm i'm imagining i'm imagining then the way you you would do that is you just sort of mention rather than saying i'm off for a month on a vacation or something like that you say i'm off for a month to do meditation retreat so i imagine you're sort of seeding it or dropping it in, it in like that and then feeling this tremendous yeah. sort of <gasps> uh oh <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah the first time i started sharing that i mean most the work i do i i generally get very close to my clients like i've had clients for up to I'm working with a client right now who I've known for 15 years. We know each other pretty well. So, you know, it's, um, it's, but yes, it's a risk. It's a risk to do that because what if they think it's weird? What if they don't want somebody, you know, affecting their environment, talking to, you know, key stakeholders who's gone off and done a month long meditation retreat? You know, fortunately, I always worked with socially responsible organizations. That was my specialty. So, you know, there was already an open mindedness and um, a sense of caring about the world that was present in, in the clients that I worked with. So, but yeah, it was, it was a little bit scary at first to, to say it. But yeah, if I'm going to be gone for a month, not even looking at emails, I have to tell them. <laughs> not much of a choice there. Yeah. That's very interesting. And, you know, before we return to the, the sort of more specifics, biographically speaking, you also mentioned uh, before you did your one year retreat, you achieved a great deal of professional success and satisfaction, but also you'd had sort of, you know, a, a full, uh, I think you said full relational life or, you know, relationships and so on. I'm curious also how the, well, the same thing, this, this deepening into your, um, spiritual practice, if you want, affected your relational life? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, well, it's, it depends on which partner I'm talking about, I guess. You know, when, I mean, in my 20s, when I was married to my first husband, I wasn't, I did meditate, but I wasn't really, like, into the spiritual path. And when we um, uncoupled, that was opened up like a whole window into my life where I could really be doing what was most important to me. And that's what I talked about with Santa Barbara. Um, and then I was with a partner and I was a stepmother in that relationship. And we were together for seven years and he was um, 
he was interested in spirituality. We're still friends. You know, we had lunch a couple weeks ago. Um, but it was like I could see that it was becoming the centerpiece of my life, actually, that everything else went around my spiritual life. So that's a big shift. Like that was a big shift for me rather than seeing it as a part of my life to see it as the core of my life and everything, my work, my relationships, my health, my, you know, financial situation, all of that is in support of my spiritual life. That's different. And so when I got to that stage, that was part of why we uncoupled actually. We weren't married, but you know, we had a very deep, loving seven year relationship. We lived together and um, so that was hard, but it, it, it was the right thing for me. And then in my, my second marriage, I married somebody who was just as much of like a spiritual warrior as I am. And that was Stephen, who, you know, we basically became teachers together. We, we never planned on doing any of that, but we met. It was so karmic, our meeting, because we met because of the Powak retreat. You know, we met because of a mutual friend. I was having tea with him, and we went out to put money in our meters. And Stephen, my, ex, my now ex-husband, we were together 14 years, he came out and we all met and, you know, we had lunch and within six weeks we were married. So <laughs> it was kind of a whirlwind, but we just, it was like we came together and it was so clear we needed to be together. And then, you know, we had no idea we were going to become, do the retreat and become teachers as a result of that. That was never our plan. We just really appreciated that, like, when we met, we could we looked at each other. And it was so clear when we talked that we were seeing somebody who had the same level of commitment and passion um, about um, spiritual life, living that 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 the other had. And so it was a great support, I think, for both of us to have a partner who was equally committed. What is it about the shared passion? Because presumably, especially in the circles that you were moving in at that time, a lot of the people would have been also very intensely dedicated to practice because there is that end of the pool. Yeah. What was it about, okay, here's a person with a shared passion. What's the line from that to we should get married for almost two decades? Yeah, well, I think what it was, that was um, right after my year-long solo retreat. So there was a way, like when we saw each other, um, what I find often is that I can tell if somebody else has had a, a depth of an awakening experience where they are more living from that or there's a continuity of that. I mean, Steve and I call this the 51% rule, um, but I could see that in him and he could see it in me. And it was like that, that was, it's a level of understanding about what we are and the human experience that's deeper than just being a dedicated practitioner. And we both, he had had that experience like a long time ago and I had just had it. So we, there's a way where he could sort of um, show me the ropes a little bit and I could revitalize um, his experience. Um, of that level of depth of the spiritual path. So that, you know, there, I was around a lot of people, but I wasn't around a lot of people. I was around a lot of people who are deep practitioners, but, you know, that's like another level that I think he and I could feel in each other that was like, wow, I found somebody who really understands. That's fascinating. Your emphasis on both deep spiritual practice and experience and integration into life really opens up, I think, a whole basket of questions that are not normally, um, that don't normally sort of seem obvious. And one of the things that I've noticed, people report mostly privately, it's not something that's spoken about a great deal, at least that not that I've seen, is that while we're on the topic of relationships, is that as one, uh, one's practice uh, and experience deepens in that way, it can disrupt some of the normal forces that propel people into a relationship and 
continue a relationship. People very often lose interest in relationship or uh, find that their normal paradigms or the normal driving forces that would inspire a relationship to occur um, have somehow been disrupted or reconfigured or sometimes seemingly misplaced. Did you ever experience any kind of rewiring or reworking uh, as a consequence of the practice of that side of your life? Mm, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I mean, I went through a phase where I was completely celibate by choice and I had no interest in relationship. And I really, it was clear that I needed to um, do that really intentionally. Uh, this was before the year long solo retreat and um, like a number of years before. And it was important to explore that, um, that feeling of going outward and like needing another for completion or fulfillment, you know, that, that kind of um, lack orientation that a lot of times relationship is coming from and to really work that within myself. So I, I, I did spend several years doing that at one point um, and that was important. And then I also, um, because, you know, romantic relationship involves sexuality, which isn't really part of our other relationships unless one has an open relationship, you know, it's kind of, a, very specific to a person or certain people, um, it brings a different quality of intimacy than because there's so much of the physicality as part of that. So I got very interested in the tantric practices and how that aspect of relationship can be part of the spiritual path. And so that to me was a way that um, that became more integrated into my relationship as something that isn't, uh, that is, has the potential for um, a deep kind of spiritual understanding within the relationship. So those are for me ways that, um, that my relational space has become rewired um, as, yeah, as a result of my spiritual path. When you say tantric there, do you mean the, the view of tantrism or specifically practices such as karma mudra and so on, which is Tibetan Buddhist uh, practices to do with sexuality and so on? Yeah, well, I'll just say that I, you know, I, I'm not an expert at it. So I, I want to be clear about that. Um, but it's including this, the sexuality, the sexual practices as part of it, you know, potentially. But it's more the energy with a person that, that the, the sexuality can be part of, um, part of one's spiritual path. So for me, it's, that's when I talk about this, it, it, that's the broad umbrella that I would be referring to. Right. The, the tantric view in which those energies are welcomed and work with, not only specifically sexual practices that are a subset of the tantric uh, approach. Right. Yeah. So, the t you know, again, this is where I, I bridge between Theravada Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism. And really, my worldview is much more Tibetan Buddhist. And I, I now teach um, Dzogchen practices. And um, so that view that life is everything that we're experiencing is part of our spiritual practice and nothing's left out, including sexuality. That's so fascinating. Thank you for speaking to that because I think um, for real people interested in engaging in these sorts of practices, this is the sort of thing that one wonders about or indeed one faces. So I, I think it's extremely valuable and interesting. Um, so let's talk now about that one year retreat. You entered into the, to one year of solar retreat in your in your apartment in your condominium in San Francisco, and you, you mentioned you had had a sense uh, of an imminent awakening. Uh, it was sort of just just a little out of reach or right right there. And it's so fascinating to read about what you've what you've written about that that time period. You did several different types of practices over the course of the year. 
you weren't just doing the same set set throughout. I think you changed as the year went on. So I'm curious, can you give us a sense of your day to day practice schedule and also how you chose which practices to emphasize at different times as the year progressed? Mm hmm. Yeah. So just to give you kind of the arc of the year, um, January, I was practicing solo. Um, and then February, I actually went to Spirit Rock and did the month long there and I didn't break silence. I just left before that and went back to my condo in Mill Valley. So it's right near San Francisco. Um, and, uh, and then I was practicing there on my own mostly. And then I did a, a, a Zogchen retreat in the middle of the year that was nearby here. And then at the end of the year, I did the three month retreat at IMS. So there were times that I was with others practicing, but most of the year was solo. Um, yeah, so I really, the, the practices I was doing were um, concentration practice, Vipassana, Dzogchen, yoga, Qigong. I did, you know, a lot of walking meditation. I was not consuming any like media. So that was off. I was silent other than like once a month, I would resurface for a few days and call my parents and maybe have lunch with a friend in a quiet place and um, pay bills and look at email and, you know, buy whatever I needed. And then I'd go back into um, really silence for the most part. Um, and so those were the practices I was doing. And really, I would mainly do the, you know, in Dzogchen, just for people who might not know that practice, you do the Samatha, the concentration, and then the Vipassana, and then move to Rigpa, which is the non-dual practice of Dzogchen. And um, it's like a, you know, a ladder system where you, you know, are doing all of those as building blocks, basically. So I was doing that in some way. I mean, I might emphasize one or another more for a period of time, but really I was practicing Dzogchen a lot. And then I would do periods where I would shift and do the Brahma Viharas, do the concentration practice of the Brahma Viharas for a period of time exclusively because, you know, those are really pretty different. Um, so meditatively, that's mainly what I was doing for the whole year. And what would dictate your choice to switch to the Brahma Viharas, which are, for those, those who don't know, four qualities, uh, compassion and, you know, the sort of thing, equanimity and so on, that one concentrates on to develop those traits within oneself, I believe, but, but you could perhaps correct me on that. As you're practicing there, what does your decision process to say, I'm going to do the Brahma Viharas now for some, some days or, or whatever's the case? Yeah, well, a, a number of things happen during the year. I mean, the, what I would call the, the awakening experience happened in March. So um, it was really fortunate because I had a, lo a lot of the year left to really steep in that. Um, and yet, you know, there was personality material coming up and things, you know, it's sort of like the deeper you go, the, the more fundamental things get encountered. And now I've seen this with so many students that this is just pretty much how it goes. Um, and I also was having just outrageous amounts of Kundalini. And I would get that a lot with the Dzogchen to where it was like too much. I mean, there were times when I would go into public, like I remember I once went to Whole Foods in Mill Valley and the person bagging my groceries actually said to me, he was like, I can't look directly at you. You know, there's so much light coming off of you. And my, like my eyes, I'd look in the mirror. When I went to the Dzogchen retreat, the person doing sound who I knew from other Dzogchen retreats, he came over and he said, what is going on with you? Your eyes are like laser beams, you know? So it was a lot of energy and I've had to manage that. I, I had to do a lot to um, just have that not be overwhelming. And there were times I was a little worried about it, but it never really got, uh, I, I don't, it, it never 
like, you know, I'd read books like Gopi Krishna's book on Kundalini, it would scare me that something bad might happen, but it, it didn't. But there were times when I needed to just switch off and not keep doing Dzogchen. And the Brahma Viharas were um, our purification of the heart. So there's a way that they're very relational with oneself and others in terms of being able to respond to really any human condition with an unhindered heart. And the practices help us to work with what blocks that basically, you know, what blocks that loving orientation towards just everyone or what blocks uh, compassion, especially for those we might not feel deserve it. You know, the Donald Trumps of the world or whoever that is for us. Um, or with joy being maybe having envy for other people's good fortune or equanimity. Why, why are these awful things happening? It doesn't make any, any sense, but equanimity practice allowing us to um, be at peace because of that contact we have with the, with the ground of being where there's a, a rightness even in the wrongness. You know, there's, and that's where the equanimity comes from. So then those, that's why I was doing those practice was, was both to um, balance out the energy from the Dzogchen and then to um, cultivate a more unhindered heart. In response to something that would come up during your meditation, personality material? No, it wasn't so much like there was one time when, um, I really wanted, like in the in the Brahma Viharas, you can choose people. You can choose different categories of people or a specific person. And so I did like, I can't remember the details now, a week or two weeks of the Brahma Viharas with just each parent. One with one parent, one with the other parent, you know, and because those relationships are so, you know, they're so, so much complexity that I really wanted to have that focus. And then at the end of those, I dedicated all the merit of that to each parent, you know? Um, so it wasn't so much in response to something that was happening. It was more, um, it, it was very intuitive and very fluid. I would say it wasn't like I had a plan at the beginning of the year. Now I'm going to do two weeks on this and then that. And it was very, it was a lot more fluid than that. Yeah. So that's really how the year went. It was a little bit hard because when I went to um, the three month retreat at IMS, I had already been doing Zogchen for long and I, so for so long, and I really wanted to keep doing it. And, but those retreats are Vipassana oriented. So that, you know, was a little bit, I had, you know, he had to navigate that, but, um, it just was an incredible year. And when it ended and I knew I had to go back and start working again, it was, that became the integration then became what I've been doing the last 15 years. <laughs> and that's where the diamond approach came in for me, you know, being more of a, like you said, a tantric practice of using everything, but then also including the psychological understanding um because if we're going to be in the world doing things that are likely to trigger um conditioning the psychological understanding is really useful you know the spiritual to me is how we ex get to have the contact with what we are more fundamentally, but the psychological, this is what our era has added, in my opinion, to the, the traditions that have been around forever is the psychological understanding that allows us, you know, in the old days, the solution was you renounce money, you renounce sexuality, you renounce working in the world, all those, you renounce possessions. It's, you know, fairly universal. And if we're going to be in the world not renouncing, we're going to get triggered a lot more and have a lot more opportunities to um, embarrass ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> As we can see from the many, many scandals that are always happening. So um, that's where I personally don't feel that the historical traditions 
they don't have that wasn't part of their understanding they didn't have psychology so um, that's what we have today that can make it possible to be in the world and do our best to live from um, a deeper place is to me that psychological understanding and integration helps a lot and I'd love to circle round to that shortly um, may I ask, ask you a little bit more about that one year retreat sure yeah, I mean, it does. That sounds to me like so great. I fantasize about that sort of thing a lot. Really? Well, I would encourage you to do it. I, I've had a number of people, you know, this is something people come to me for is like, how do I do a solo retreat? Or if you can do it, do it because it's wow. Well, we can talk later. <laughs> Yeah, I live on this little, uh, this narrow boat, canal boat. I don't know if you've ever seen those long, thin canal boats that they have in the UK. That's where I live. I have. That is the sort of perfect floating meditation place. And yeah, I have fantasies about sort of casting off for a year and, you know, turning off the Wi-Fi and that'd be great. But anyway, so regarding the, you know, you were mentioning there about all this energetic phenomena that were happening to you related to your Dzogchen practice. Did your Dzogchen practice include Talung and specific energy work? Or did those phenomena come simply as a consequence of your general practice that you were doing? Well, they came from the general practice, but there was, um, I was doing the um, inner fire practice. I, I hadn't been taught that practice, but um, I read about it and it was like, I just felt like I needed to do it. So I read, um, I can't remember his name now, but there's an, one excellent book on it. And I just did the best I could. And I actually, the Tumal practice. And um, I did feel that it helped. And I mean, at one point, this was a few years before my solo retreat, I actually had a Kundalini rising that knocked me unconscious right in the middle of the meditation hall at Spirit Rock on a month long. I mean, it was, I, I, I have some unusual experiences, you know, and, um, so yeah, that was that was part of it. Um, yeah, so I did Tumo. I I don't think I, there was anything else that I did related to that, other than I would just like I would have to find ways to ground out the energy. Like there were times I would just lay on the bed and just shake, you know, to see to like see if I could have it um, some of the energy drain off. That book, um, the book you're talking about there, the, the people that come to mind, Lama, Lama Yeshe is one who wrote a book. That's, that's it, Lama Yeshe, yeah. Yeah, Glenn Mullen uh, is an author who's translated quite a lot of Tumo texts. Oh. He's a Canadian oh. author, and um, I've interviewed him a, a couple of times. I'll, I'll send you the links. Oh, great, yeah. That's fascinating. So you're sort of doing DIY Tumo. That's amazing. Yeah. That's very unusual. It, it, I know. I know it was really. I probably shouldn't have. And like all of the official teachers, I asked numerous teachers to um, work with me on the on the year long, and they all they all said no, because they didn't want to be responsible if like I had a psychotic break or something, at Shagat. You know, they can't be monitoring me all the time. And so how can they really assure my safety? So I, I had a, like these safety nets in place. I had a, a friend who had been down this road before me like by five years or something. And he was really my mentor and he was available on call anytime I needed him, which was maybe like every couple of weeks. And so I'm very grateful to him that he was willing to do that. And then I had a friend who, um, we had an agreement that I would email him like every three days and just like, I'm okay. I mean, now it would be a text, but I'm okay. And then if I didn't, he would come over and make sure that I was okay. And did he do that? So did he have to come I over? Never, I, he never had to come over, but it gave me a lot of peace of mind just to know that I had a safety net. And again, I'm so grateful to him that he was willing to just be there in case I got into a bad place, but I never did. You you later, I believe later, uh, worked with a teacher at Sokya Rinpoche. Was that later or before? It was before, before, during, and after. So it was before I'd done many Dzogchen. That's where I learned Dzogchen was from Sokni and Minjur Rinpoche, you know, their brothers. 
um, that's where I learned Dzogchen. So I'd done a lot of Dzogchen retreats before, and then when I did the one in the middle of the year, that was with Sokni, and I've since done retreats with um, them as well. One of the interesting aspects of, of what he, he talks about is he often talks about trauma, as in the sort of trauma we'd, we'd know about from Western psychological uh, theory, being somehow... Uh, stored or lodged or uh, impacted somehow in the subtle body, which is where, from the Tibetan sort of point of view, a lot of those energy practice, uh, energy experiences you're having would be taking place, uh, I believe. But once again, correct me if I've, if I've mischaracterized that. Did you feel that there was any trauma or trauma release component during that period? Or was that not an aspect that seemed extant? Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. Well, I have a very significant birth trauma, and that has been something I've worked with for about 30 years. So um, that's been, it's very physical. It's very in, in the cells, in the tissues. And um, it's been a long journey working with that, and I'm still working with it a little. It's not completely gone even now um, because I almost died at birth. I mean, I was literally seconds away from death. You know, I was breech, the cord was wrapped around my neck. I started, my lungs got activated, so I was drowning. I mean, it was, I guess I didn't want to come out or something. But um, uh, it was, I, I now think that some of, like, for me, the belief that Stephen and I have, you know, after, again, working with lots of students and people in our retreats, I'd say maybe a third of people have energy phenomenon. So we give a whole talk on how to work with too much energy. You know, we have a whole set of prep methods that we teach people, and some of them are pretty effective. And they're things that, you know, I had to learn, and nobody really had that much advice. Um, but I didn't know as much about trauma at the time I did the year long solar retreat as I do now. And, um, yeah, I think, oh, so what I was going to say was that Stephen and I really believe that when people are having, like for me, when I had all that Kundalini stuff, I didn't know if this would go on the rest of my life. You know, I kind of thought that it, this was just part of my path. But over the years, actually even over the year long, um, like somehow I believe that it's our nervous systems getting refined, getting upgraded, actually. I feel like my nervous system got an upgrade. And um, I'm now I don't have those strong things. I, I still, I'm very sensitive. Um, but... I'm also a lot more like I don't, I, when I've done long retreat experience, I don't hurt when I go into the grocery store anymore. You know, I, I've gotten a lot more integrated over the years. And so I, I think there's the theory, my theory is that there's something going on in our nervous system with that that's trying to work through the trauma and um, be more more balanced, less um, sort of, it's, it's like there's too much, like a short circuit in a, in a wire. In some of the yogic practices, you're really trying to like activate a kundalini rising. When I had my kundalini rising, it happened by itself. So like for me, that would have been too much. Like I had too much trauma in my system to be able to tolerate like a forced kundalini rising, something like that. Yeah, that's interesting. And and so do you think that nervous system upgrade is primarily in the area of fluidity in terms of moving between states and different environments of stimuli? Is that, is that the primary upgrade? You know, I don't know. I mean, I've been studied by Yale and all they would tell me at the end was that I said, well, how did it go? And of course, they can't tell you. But they said, well, it confirmed our hypothesis. So that's all I know. Um, you know, and they were studying a lot of other people in the study I was in too. But um, I think there's something, you know, now they know so much about like the brains of advanced meditators and that we actually have more gray matter 
I mean, there's so many, the neuroplasticity levels. And um, so I think all of that is part of what got upgraded, but it's, it's almost like maybe being a tuning fork for, um, for what we are that's beyond the body and the personality, like, like a TV, you know, when we used to have TVs that would pick up signals through the ethers, you know, um, with antenna, it's like I, maybe the antenna for the more subtle experiences is getting refined. I mean, I'm totally making that up, but that's what it felt like. It feels like some kind of receptors or something for um, deeper kinds of spiritual awareness is getting refined. You know, you were mentioning there about your attempt to recruit some teachers to, you know, give you a bit of input, but none of them, I suppose, wanted to face the lawsuit, I guess, or whatever. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I don't want to make that sound bad. And they, like, if I went to retreats, of course, they'd help me. But in terms of ongoing, like, phone calls and things like that, and I get it. I mean, I've never had a psychotic break on any of my retreats, but I hear about it from other people. And it's, like, scary. You don't want to do harm like that, you know? Yeah, of course. And I was that's the point I was going to make is that, you know, often I hear people lament the unavailability of their teachers. Oh, I can't, you know, never have contact with, you know, my teacher or this teacher, or whatever it is. And of course, part, part of the problem is from the teacher's point of view, which, of course, you know, now is as, as a popular teacher, the more popular you are, the more people want your time. And in, in a certain sense, therefore, the less time you have to go to go around, you know, and I often I often th think about that it must be very interesting for some of these very popular teachers in that sense. And, you know, you, you have talked in the past about the importance of contact with a teacher, some kind of contact with a teacher. Yeah. And in fact, on your own retreats, when you teach retreats, you meet really rather regularly every second day or so with each student as a sort of protocol. Right. Some retreats, you've got to sort of write your name down to, to get an interview and this sort of thing, but it's part of your routine or schedule. Um, you've had some very, let's say, popular I mean, I use that word specifically not about depth, but about how many people also want to talk to that teacher. You've had a lot of very popular or well-known, highly sought-after teachers. What's your? Have you found your relationship to uh, your teachers in that sense? Have you have you ever really worked very closely uh, over a period of time with a, in a personal relationship with the teacher, or has it often been little bits of contact here and there, and then you're sort of DIYing the in-between period? <laughs> I love that DIY. Yeah, that's a really, I like the way you're saying that. Well, the way that the model set up in Theravadan and even in Tibetan Buddhism that I've been part of, it's like when you're with the teachers on retreat, well, even in Tibetan Buddhism, like I once had an interview with Stephanie Rinpoche privately. And that's only because I was doing a year long solo retreat. So they let me go first before all the teachers met with them privately. You know, they kind of slipped me in because of what I was doing, even though I wasn't a teacher, which I really appreciated, you know, but I had one private interview with him. That's it. In your entire relationship with Tony Rinpoche, you've had one yes. private interview yes. with him. Gosh. <laughs> yeah. The way that he does it, at least that I know of, is that he, like, if you go to Crestone for the summer retreat, he has open Q&A times when you can go up. What I did get though, he used to have um, like an assistant with him. Oh gosh, I wish I could remember his name. No. Lama Tashi, I think it was Lama Tashi. Anyway, he was awesome. And you could go up and ask him questions like during certain times and I made a lot of use of that. And I asked a lot of questions in the big group too. So um, that is really what you have in the Theravada system that I practiced in a lot, you would have interviews like every second day or every, if it's a month, every third day, you know, you don't need as many. But that I think is a good model, even though it's only 15 minutes, you're seeing a teacher. And if you need something extra, if it's really an emergency, you can see somebody. So on retreats, I really like the Theravada model and that's what I use even though it's not done really in Tibetan Buddhism so much. In between, like I used to see um, 
Guy Armstrong and Sally Armstrong. I was part of one of their original groups that they had privately in their home for advanced students. And so I would see him for years. I saw them going back and forth every month. And that was really helpful. Um, and then in the Diamond Approach, you, which I've now been in for 13 years or something like that, yeah, um, you can work with a private teacher. And so Sandra Maitri has been my large group teacher, and I do feel I have a personal relationship with her, even though she doesn't do one-on-ones. And then I've worked with some of the, um, they have like other teachers that do the small groups and the one-on-ones. And I have been working with a teacher like monthly, not maybe not the whole 13 years, but um, that has been very helpful. At your level of, of practice, do you find it's necessary for that sort of a, I suppose you could say mentoring or coaching kind of relationship? Is it necessary for the person to be a deeper practitioner than yourself? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, when I first, yes, I, I think, well, there's two answers to that, I would say. I think ideally the answer would be yes because then the person knows the territory, even though you know, any teacher isn't gonna know everything a student is experiencing, you know, just because their own path, they may not have experienced everything, but they know the terrain, not from books, but from having walked the terrain. I think that's really important. I really do. Um, and at the same time, like when I first started in the Diamond Approach, because the Diamond Approach is really about the integration psychologically, and like the person you're working with one-on-one -on -one is really helping you to inquire into your present moment experience with a certain thread that then helps you integrate psychologically. They bring a technology, a spiritual technology that like when I first did it, I had a teacher that was, you know, anyway, there, I think there's a place where somebody, if they're bringing a skill set, they might not need to be more advanced. But at some point, if, if to me, if, if a person's going to work with a teacher over a long period, they really need somebody who's farther along than they are. That, that would be my view. That must be a little tricky for you to find someone like that. Given how unusually immersed you've been in, in practice, I mean, lots of people, of course, practice for a lifetime. Um, but as, as we, but you've done your year long and now I'd like to you know, next talk about your, your time with Park Sidor. Well, there's him and there's no question he's more advanced than I am. So, <laughs> But he's not Skyping you on a monthly basis, is he? No, I, but I will say that when I was practicing intensively with him, I had a very deep and even like personal, that hasn't been the case lately, but that was the case for probably five years. And... Yes, and just being being around him, I would like get a contact high, you know, because um, he would come to the U.S. periodically, and then he would, you know, Steve and I, he was doing solo retreats then, trying to, well, our story, you know, he's a monastic, so he can't say what stage he's at, but the word on the street was always that he was stage three in Theravada, there's only four stages, and he was trying to work to getting to four before he passed away, which, you know, he's in his 80s and his health isn't great. So we didn't want to disturb him. And so, you know, he he would come on these solo two retreats and we'd be asking the people attending to him how he was doing. And, you know, one time he said to them, why haven't Tina and Stephen come to visit me? And we were like, ah, oh, you know, we just like scrambled down to get down there as fast as we could. But, you know, we didn't want to disturb him on his private retreat. Um, but yeah, that was, that's been a very sweet relationship. Let's talk about uh, that. I mean, I think we could probably talk for you know another hour about your one year retreat, you know, your dream yoga things you were doing and 24 hour practice and yeah, so on. I didn't even mention that. So I was like practicing 24 hours a day. That's the other thing because I was doing dream yoga and I got really, you know, pretty good at it. So, I mean, it's no wonder I had too much Kundalini going on. Okay, we have to talk about that now that it's, we've sort of accidentally stumbled on it. So, all right. Is this another DIY, you know, advanced, advanced practice that you just read a book and then, then were able to do? What was your dream yoga routine and practice and so on? Yeah, 
Was it a DIY? Um, and I don't say that disparagingly, by the way. No, I'm not hearing it that way at all. I mean, um, like with the TUMO, you know, there there weren't a lot of options. You really couldn't get TUMO training anywhere that I knew of. So I just sort of made, did the best I could. Um, I, I think that I um, did some actual learning slash training with Stephen LaBerge. I may not be saying his last name right, but... Um, you know, it's not Tibetan, but basically the lucid dreaming techniques are effective. He's the lucid dreaming guy, really, of of, of in terms of, of Western science, right. or one of one of two or three. Right, right. So I did, I you know, did things with him. I, I can't remember if I like went to a workshop or did his audio programs, which would be a little more of a DIY. Um, and then in Tibetan Buddhism, I mainly read books about Tibet, the Tibetan version of that. But I, I did more of a simplified one, like what he, what Stephen um, LeBerge teaches, because it just was effective. What was your protocol then in terms of waking up in the dream? And what did you do when you'd woken up in the dream? Yeah, well, I and I kept a dream journal, which for the whole year, I had been doing that leading up to that. I did it for maybe three or four years. I kept a dream journal that I really used almost every day. And it was so fascinating, like seeing that I would have symbols in dreams that took me, like they recur in different dreams. And I'm going, what is this thing symbolizing? You know, and at some point I would get it and I'd have these huge insights into my own unfoldment and, and material that I didn't have access to, like psychologically, and to be able to access it through the dream journaling and analysis that's a little different and then in dream yoga um a lot of flying um i didn't i for some reason i didn't really want to manipulate the dreams a lot it felt um more like being conscious and this is where the tibetan like in tibetan buddhism there's a belief that if you can realize rigpa three times in a dream, I think this is it. I might be a little off here, but it's something like that. Then you will you will be able to realize Rigpa at death. And if you can realize Rigpa at death, then that changes the whole death experience. So that's really what I was seeing if I could cultivate, um, where I was just basically, you know, practicing Dzogchen day and night that was really more like in my dream state, I was more trying to see if I could do what I was doing during the day with my practice in the dream state. And it was Sokin Rinpoche, I assume, who, who gave you the pointing out instructions or the introduction to that, that state of Rigpa. It was actually Ninjur was the first time, of course, you know, subsequently Sokin, I had those instructions from him, but the first time he got sick and so Ninjur, Gosh, he was so young then. He was like in his 20s. And he showed up and we were told, so Rinpoche is sick, his brother Minju is going to sub for him. And he, that was my first Zogchen retreat. So, um, and yeah, I, this was before the year long solo retreat, maybe two, two or three years before. And yeah, I realized Rigpa the first time that he gave the instruction. So it was pretty, um, I was pretty, wowed by that and i wanted to keep practicing that what is that uh, process for those who who may not be aware i think it, i think it's a fascinating approach the you know the introduction to mind yeah. and, and how that goes yeah well um i really like that like I'll, I'll just give you the simplified version of my understanding of zochen um which is starting with bodhicitta which is the the heart practice of really, like I would every morning on my year long solar retreat, I had an altar and I had um, statements that I would say, they were like um, taking the refuges and I had and the intention of awakening for the benefit of all beings and really it being an act that was for myself, but was really for humanity. You know, I, I just so believe now even more that when we work on ourselves and we clear out the 
egoic material and the conditioning that we're actually affecting the whole consciousness of of you know the collective consciousness of humanity if not all beings so um so anyway so it starts with bodhicitta which is really that heart intention of why am i practicing and that it's for for the greater good and then um then starting with the concentration, stabilizing awareness with an object like the breath or something else. Um, and then going to Vipassana, opening the awareness into just whatever is flowing, like stream of consciousness awareness, but not being identified with or attached to that, the contents of awareness. And then um, in Dzogchen, the way I teach it, I've added a little step in there, which is to, to notice non-doing, which is once the Vipassana is fairly stable and there's a sense of just watching phenomena arise or being aware of phenomena arising, um, then to notice non-doing, that there's no doing necessary to be noticing that. And then with Rigpa, um, then once that's stable, and there's a settledness, there's the possibility of, of turning, doing one of two things, either turning the mind on itself to see that basically there's no self there, there's no self structure, that all of this can happen by itself without a me being there, um, or there's the backward step version. So like mostly what I learned from Sokni was the mind turning and Minjir, where the mind, you look, you use the object to look at the mind that's looking at the object. And then if Rigpa arises, then non-duality is arising, basically. And that sense of the subject and the object collapses. And there's just, you know, depending on one's experience, either unity or there could be emptiness um, or both. So that would be, that's, sort of Zogchen in one minute or less. <laughs> so 15 years ago, shortly after your year-long retreat, uh, you attended a retreat with Burmese meditation master, Venerable Pa Ok Sayadol, and you achieved something quite remarkable and unusual, which is you completed the entire shamatha path of that lineage. And I'm going to read something here from your, your book that you co-wrote with Stephen Snyder, who you, who you mentioned previously, uh, your book, Practicing the Jhanas, to give people a sense of what that achievement entails. So on our retreat, the Venerable Pa Ok Seador required us to gain the five masteries in each jhana before moving on to the next jhana. And there are eight jhanas, which I expect you'll mention. The five masteries, which are outlined in the Vasudhi Magga, as indicating that the meditator has demonstrated stability and strength in a particular jhana are one, to call or direct the attention to the jhana factors, two, to enter jhana whenever desired, three, to resolve to stay in a jhana for a determined duration and to keep the time resolve. And in, in your case, that meant sitting down, entering a jhana, which is a very deep absorption state for two to three hours at a stretch and emerging on time <laughs> without looking at the clock which is very interesting. Number four, to emerge from jhana at the determined time. And five, to review the jhana factors. In other words, having ex ex exited the jhana to be able to glance back and, and, and see the, you know, the, the jhana factors there. Only when the teacher is satisfied that the student has indeed completed the five masteries in connection with full absorption in the first jhana, will the student be directed towards the second jhana and so on. And, that's, and that doesn't really even indicate that then there, you have to do that with 10 casinas. Uh, and then from there, uh, de various other meditations like meditating on the skeleton or meditating on the different parts of, parts of the body in a very s systematic way. So it's really quite exhaustive uh, in a way and maybe exhausting, but certainly exhaustive. So, I mean, can you, can you talk a little bit about that retreat? Well, you know, why you decided to, to, to do that? And, you know, I'm also very interested if when you, when you started to get the sense that I actually might be able to nail this, I might be able to complete that, because I don't think that's really expected that anyone would do that. 
no one had before. So, I mean, when I went to the retreat, I was told by um, my teachers that, you know, this would be a good thing to do because Pac is the, like, the most, um, he's the most knowledgeable person really alive today in this area. And, and they, Guy Armstrong is the one who suggested I go to study with Pac Side Out because of things that had happened on my year long retreat. And it just was like, he's the one who knows best. So if you can go and study with him, that would be a great thing to do. So it just turned out that Pac was coming for his first retreat in the States. You know, it was like a year and a half or two marches after I finished my year. So, and that was how Stephen and I met. I've already said that. Um, so when I went, I was basically, I thought I had experienced the jhanas in a really deep way on my year, but I couldn't, you know, I was really told you need to go to him for confirmation of what happened. And um, so I, that's what I was going with was really not knowing he might say, no, that's not what you experienced or, you know, I really didn't know. And I wanted to know the truth. And that was the most important thing to me. So I, I did also ordain as a Buddhist nun on that retreat. So, you know, a whole shape head and robes, myself and one other American woman, there were a lot of nuns there. There were enough nuns and monks there that we could actually have a, enough people to officially do the Theravadan ordination. So I was freshly shaved head and all of that. And um, he gave me my Dharma name which has a little bit of an interesting story behind it. But, you know, so I went into my first interview and I basically said to him, I, you know, I've done this year long solo retreat and I, I think that I've experienced the jhanas, but my, you know, I was suggested I come to you to see what um, you thought. And, you know, I'm like preparing to tell him what happened and stuff. And he's just like, you start at the beginning, like everybody else, <laughs> you know, focus here. That was it. Just, you know, it was irrelevant. Whatever I thought I'd experience, irrelevant. So, um, which was fine because it really didn't matter in a way. I was there to do the practice and he would see for himself what happened, you know, but it, it was a little bit humbling, but in a good way. Um, yeah. And then within days, I was hovering around first jhana and i you know he's a fairly intense teacher and fairly high bar he has an extremely high bar in terms at least then he did i think that's changed a lot over the years actually as far what I, as far as i know stephen and i are the only ones that he taught the detailed version of the samatha everyone else learned the brief and I think he just saw over the years that there weren't going to be very many people who could do the detailed. And so he kind of lowered the requirements just so people could move through it, you know, faster. Um, yeah, so that was it. And I just started at the beginning like everybody else. But within a few days, he could, he could see something's happening here because he's only had a small number of people complete all eight jhanas in the whole how many years has he been teaching? 60, 50? He's only had a few people, you know? So it was, he was pretty, I think, um, astounded by what was happening. And um, he just, you know, first John had the five masteries. He made Steve and I do the five masteries on every single thing we did. And when it first happened, you know, I didn't really know. I'd read the book, but I just thought, there's no way I'm going to be able to do any of that. You know, I mean, how does this even work doing a time resolve? You know, it's impossible, but somehow it works. I mean, I, I had read that Deepa Ma used to be able to do this. She would sit down and say, I'm going to meditate for a day. And she would sit and knock it up for a whole day. So, you know, what I, my practice pales in comparison to that. But there is a way that the time resolves can happen, and I've had a few students who were able to do these things too. Could you clarify what a time resolve is? Yeah, so with the jhanas, um, 
just having the jhana arise is kind of a big thing because you can't make it happen. I mean, first of all, not everybody is going to even have the who even had first jhana happen. Um, so at first, it's like your your level of concentration, the um, dormancy of the ego self. So there has to be enough comfort with being out of the ego, which I already had since the awakening had happened. So for me, I think this is part of why it was easier that I came in with that. But even so, it doesn't mean that a person has the capacity for the concentration and other things just because the you know, awakening has happened. But that helped. Um, so the jhana will, if one has the capacity, it will start arising, but it'll be unstable. It might only happen for a few seconds and then minutes. And then at some point, it gets stable enough that one can say, like, may first jhana arise strongly and the jhana will arise more at will. That's the first thing is to have it arise at will. And then once, because if you can't do that, everything else is irrelevant. So then when it can arise at will, then one starts experimenting with like resolving. This is a Buddhist thing that one can do is called resolves. One would resolve may first jhana arise for 20 minutes. And when a jhana is arising, you're not opening your eyes. That's not a jhana, you know? So um, you don't know what time it is when the jhana ends, you look at the clock and you see if it was 20 minutes or not. And it takes a little while, but it took a, a very small amount of time actually for that to start happening. And then you do longer and longer. In his case, he wanted like first jhana for me, Stephen was doing different practice then. So I was really the only one going through this at the time that I was, which is like the first week of the retreat. Um, he eventually wanted me to do four hours. And I just told him I can't do, I mean, I the most, the longest I'd ever done a sitting before then was maybe like an hour and a half or two hours. And I just said, I can't do four hours. I mean, I, I have to go to the bathroom and stuff, you know? <laughs> and he just said four hours, keep doing it until you've done four hours. And eventually I did four hours. So, yeah, so basically with the resolve, you resolve, may, so you have to have the jhana arise and then it's solid for four hours and then you come out of it, basically. <laughs> it's kind of unbelievable, but it actually, it, it, it does actually work. And I, he, he didn't continue that level of rigor with others. So I don't know, like when I, the last time that Steve and I asked him, he hadn't made people, anyone else do a four hour. But I think he, when I asked him later, he basically wanted to see what I could do. And did, was there a moment in the interviews where he, you saw him um, surprised or did he communicate the exceptional nature of what, what was going on in your <laughs> retreat there at all? Or did he kind of keep his poker face? <laughs> That's a good question. Well, have you ever seen any videos or pictures? I'm sure you've seen pictures of him. He's he's a very warm, boisterous person. He's not stoic, you know. He smiles a lot. Um, he laughs. Um, I, you know, I think he didn't want to disrupt my practice, so he didn't let on too much, but. Um, we knew other people who told us that he was like calling people and emailing them and telling them what was happening. Like on, while we, I was still practicing because it was so, uh, you know, it was so unusual. And um, so I, I, he, he, he tried to stay, I think, pretty neutral so that he wouldn't affect my practice. I mean, I didn't actually know how unusual it was. I didn't know that I was the first person, first woman, Western woman to do it, lay or monastic. I didn't know that until after the retreat. I didn't really have a sense of how significant it was at all. 
You know, I mean, I just, I didn't go there trying to do this. I went there just to find out what was going on in my practice. I didn't go there saying, I'm going to complete all eight jhanas. That, it, it wasn't like I was going there with a, um, a goal. And so I didn't research what was common. I, I didn't really get how unusual it was until after. And, you know, for people who want the really detailed you know, version of the practice that you were taking through the detailed version. It is in your book, Practicing the Jhanas, which is which you wrote with Stephen Snyder, a fantastic uh, book. And like I mentioned, um, it's not just simply, you know, concentrate on the breath and going into these deep states. Then you use various different casinos and using different colors and using different elements and so on. It's it's really very fascinating. I'm curious, you know, I would like to talk about the awakening experience that you had during your, your year retreat. But of the two, the sort of you talked about the Theravadan four path model, and I don't know if you can say where you where you think you are in in those four paths or not. I mean, some people I, they don't like to talk about it, but would you say that is more difficult or rare than the mastery of that of that jhana path? Because they both seem very rarefied, but certainly many more people are talking about first path, second path, third third path, and fourth path, and so on than they are, you know achieving mastery of these hard jhanas as they're called it's way more common for people to experience awakening than it is to do the jhanas especially the upper jhanas it's extremely rare for people to have access to that it's like a whole different category and Powak did say this that you know some people may have access to the the form jhanas one through four but the formless it's like they're they're actually realms I feel that they are non-dual realms that people can ex people can experience non-duality in a lot of different ways. What's unique about the jhanas is the stability and the intensity of it. And that's part of why it was so valued. I mean, this was the main practice of the day when the Buddha was alive. This is what he learned from his teachers that's in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali that were you know, they think that those practices may be 5,000 years old, you know, so they're, um, they're, but yes, it's a lot more unusual to have access to all eight jhanas. That's pretty rare from what I understand. And what are the consequences of, of that accomplishment? Um, you talk a lot in the book about the benefits in terms of purification of mind and also about the acclimatization to non-dual states uh, that, that is, is a consequence of hanging around in non-dual states for so so long and coming in from so many different angles and so on. Um, so what, what have you noticed has been the consequence of, of that accomplishment? Well, um, you know, we talked about the rewiring and the jhanas themselves are a, are a big rewiring. They're a really intense rewiring. Like when I would practice Dzogchen, I would always feel a lot of energy on the top of my head. And that's part of why I, I needed to take breaks from doing it during the year. I'd switch over to the Brahm Viharas. Um, in the jhanas, it's even more intense because of the concentration level and the mind stream is so unified. Um, so like the word, the words purification of mind, some people think it's a euphemism. I don't really think it's a euphemism. I think it's actually doing things to consciousness and maybe even to the brain, I don't know. Um, and I've learned this even more having students you know, I don't have any students who've gone past the fourth jhana, but like even if somebody experiences the first jhana, like the first time somebody experiences the first jhana, it's intense. Like, you know, something really different is happening. So I think it's like for me and Steve and I have talked about this a lot because he also experienced the jhanas on that retreat. He, I was like ahead of him in the sequence. So it was kind of cool because um, we could help each other you know, um, but it's like a, something opens, like with the concentration, it's like 
a laser beam. It really is like a laser beam. It's like it cuts through the rocks of the personality in a way that that hole gets drilled permanently and it never really closes, even if one is functioning from the person, you know, the personality is active. Just because this happens doesn't mean there's no personality left. That's totally not how it is. Um, but there's like an access and um, a contact with the ground of being that is um, permanent. Even without the high states of concentration required for the sort of gymnastics of, of the whole process. Yeah, that's uh, with the formless jhanas. Uh, with, and even with one through four, I mean, you know, I'm basing this on students. With the formless, it's spending that much time because not only did I have to do the masteries with the four, but with all the casinas, you know, it's a lot of time. And like there's, if we look at meditation as like exercise for our consciousness, it's like once somebody's a, a world-class athlete, their body has a memory of that capacity, you know? That's what it's like to me. That's what it's like for, for the consciousness. So, I mean, I'm not saying that I don't have egoic material that gets activated. I do, absolutely. That, that doesn't go until the fourth stage. And there's very few people, in my view, on the planet who are at fourth stage. No matter arahants or even if they're not even Buddhist, people at that level of awakening to me are extremely rare. Um, the problem is like you, for, and to me, this is part of what explains a lot of the scandals. When one has a really deep awakening experience, you know the truth in a way that you can't unknow it. And so when the personality gets activated, it can be very confusing about um, what's going on with that, you know? And this is to me where the psychological understanding is so important because monastics, the way they handled this, they just didn't go into situations where they could get into trouble. This is how it got handled in historically, um, although it still happened. So anyway, but to me, there's a change that happens that's permanent of never, um, of understanding what a person is after awakening. So I, you know, I don't know how the level of time that I've spent in the upper jhanas makes that different than somebody else. I, I don't know. Fair enough. Fair really. enough. Yeah. I mean, regarding that, that it, it, question of personality and material, you also mention, have mentioned in other places that, you know, coming out of your year retreat where you had an awakening experience, which I presume would be equivalent to in Theravada stream entry. But, but you can perhaps correct me on that or completely ignore the question as, as is some people's taste to do so. But um, you, you said you had personality material left over that you had to work with. And I'm wondering what you mean by that specifically, I suppose, uh, because I think some of the deep, some of the scandals such as, let's say, sexual scandals where um, a monastic or some sort of meditation teacher who is presumed to not be interested in such things ends up say sexually uh, harassing a student or maybe even engaging into a consensual relationship with a student which is seen culturally or, or morally to be incorrect some of the in other words core drives of a human being to replicate genetic material for instance are not in line with the cultural idea that one with the power differential shouldn't take advantage of it for say sexual or financial gain so I'm curious for you where, what that means uh, to purify the urge to replicate one's genetic material, which seems to be sort of quite built in, at least from a certain point of view, to reconcile that momentum with presumably a much later stage uh, development, morally speaking, that, well, I'm in a position of power, I shouldn't take advantage of that, sexually, let's say. You know. uh, and indeed, it, it appears that people in positions of power are often, to stay with that theme, sexually very attractive. It's sort of what uh, one thinks, gosh, 
let's you know marry up isn't it it's what you're, what you're always suggested to do and that's once again you could say there's reasons for that oh an impressive person great deal of knowledge great deal of acclaim great deal of attainment or whatever your value structure is i'd like to you know combine myself with that person <laughs> Uh, but, you, but on the other hand, well, if you do that, then it brings entire organizations down, as, as we've seen a great deal of time. So that's sort of an interesting conundrum, I think. What can you do with that uh, <laughs> ramble of question there? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll go back to the Theravadan four-stage model, which for me, even though, you know, there are the models that are good, it's the one I like the best. It's, it, to me, it's, it's um, practical. That's what I like about it. So I'll just briefly say what it, there's four stages of awakening, basically. First stage, what happens in the Theravon model is that basically you're the three defilements. So this is like the core personality patterns, which happen to map onto the Enneagram, which I love, are um, desire, so wanting things, aversion, wanting to push things away, also fears in there, and then delusion where we're just basically unconscious to ourselves and other things. Those are the core patterns. And those will, at the first stage, those drop by like 25%. And the belief, really, the, the thing that's the most life-changing to me is the belief that I'm a personality. That's really what I am at the core, that you know, being totally identified with the personality that goes away permanently. To me, that's what's significant about the first stage because you never see what you are the same again. And even if you forget or fall into delusion, you never really forget what you are. And so, but the, the reduction in suffering and also like in Buddhism, rites and rituals. So you don't believe that doing rituals and rites and ceremonies is really going to cause awakening, that the belief in that goes away. That's how it seems. So 25% reduc reduction in suffering, that's pretty good. Um, and also your behaviors would improve, theoretically, 25%. Second stage, it goes down to 50%. Third stage, 75 and at full arahant, you just aren't driven by those core personality patterns anymore at all. Um, so to me, that's kind of a useful model. And like having been, you know, deeply in this world now for 30 some years, like if I look around, even in other traditions, it kind of makes sense to me. And this also explains people could have really genuine deep awakenings, but they're still acting out, um, the instinctual drives of self-preservation, the sexual drive, the social drive those aren't completely subsumed under the enlightenment drive at until stage four. So, I mean, to me, it's it, like the idea that sexuality is somehow wrong. That's not really part of it. It's more, am I doing harm? That's really to me more of the question. Am, am I doing harm in life? And then how much am I identified with um, the ego self? So that, that to me is a way of understanding the stages that's much more neutral and much more psychological. Does that make sense? It does. May I probe a little bit there? Yeah. I mean, this is how, this is how I see it. I, I know a lot of other people see it differently. But to me, if you're going to be in the world living as a regular human, you're going to get triggered because you have a mortgage and maybe a partner and kids and a job with a boss who doesn't care that you want to do a month-long retreat or what happened there, you know, and, and you have to pay bills and drive in heavy traffic and, you know, you're going to get triggered. <laughs> that's okay. So that's very interesting. So the enlightenment drive in a certain sense subsumes those um, drives such as self-preservation, the social drive and, and this, the, the desire to replicate sexually and so on. Those sorts of core fundamental drives. That's very fascinating. And then you gave two dimensions of analyzing or reflecting upon the sexual or assessing one sexual behavior one of them was is it doing any harm and the other one is to what degree am i attached to my ego uh, or my egoic drives it's something along those lines i'm curious when you talk about doing no harm how do you see that as being quantified so for instance of course non-consensual sex could be seen 
I think, fairly without debate as being a harmful thing. So that's the obvious end. But then there are other sides. For instance, uh, uh, ending a relationship where one wants to end the relationship and the other doesn't. They will perhaps not give you a particularly good review. <laughs> in, the after, in the aftermath, at least in the immediate aftermath of that, because, you know, as an example, um, right. uh, or even uh, suggesting a relationship that the other is not interested in, in, in doing, uh, in pursuing, for instance, could that be seen as making someone sufficiently uncomfortable to be within the category of having harmed somebody with one's expression of one's desire, even if it's done skillfully, let's say. Right. How do you quantify harm in the in the grayer areas um, right. where one may may make someone uncomfortable, say, with a pr proposing a relationship or may one may make another person uncomfortable, say, leaving a relationship or in the course right. of a relationship? you know, unskillful behavior and so on, you know, saying something unpleasant to your partner or something like this could be seen as harm. Um, and how does that reflect on your, on your yeah. level well, and so on? This is to me where the psychological understanding becomes so important because it's not black and white. And also there's a whole commitment to truth. I mean, one could even divide spiritual paths based on are they more about doing good works or are they about truth because if you're dedicated to truth and say that you know you do want to leave a relationship staying in it is really it's um a an affront to the truth in a way and so there will be any time you know i've worked in the business world with human interaction for 30 years and when you get a few people together they're going to not agree about what is right and what is wrong. And I mean, even like when I was doing diversity work, you might have one culture where hugging is a big part of the culture. And if people are standoffish, they take offense. You might have another where people don't touch each other. And so if they get hugged all the time, it's very offensive. What do you do with these? No, nobody's right or wrong. You can't say who's right and who's wrong there. So to me, when you get into the area of human interaction, there are so many gray areas that um, um, I certainly don't have the answer to that. Of the questions you just said, if somebody is clearly forcing themselves on someone else, then that's a pretty clear um, violation. And, and to me, when there's a power differential, I do feel that that is inappropriate, whether it's in the workplace. I mean, I've seen this in, in organizations too, where this happens and it's there's a power differential and that's called sexual harassment. So our legal system has rules about it, you know? Um, so, I mean, I guess you can point to the law as the clearest, the clearest, but- Is sexual but, harassment the sexual content across a power differential or is it the implication that or is it the pressure for instance the boss you know uh implies or directly states to the employee that unless you engage in sexual behavior with me there will be negative consequences or if you were to engage in sexual behavior to me just leaving it out there yeah promotion may be you know more easily coming is it is it the existence of the power differential with a sexual relationship or is it the leveraging of the power differential and its benefits for a sexual relationship in your view yeah could you say that again that was really well said i think it's probably both of those you know and and i mean with spiritual teachers it's even more um dicey because it's beyond just a it's not a boss subordinate relationship where the the subordinate just can leave and go get another job or something. It's um, there's there's such a deep um, trust level, you know. Yes, and the conflict of interest I think is a fascinating dynamic there, because one is in a meditation interview where the transaction is one of meditational advice, and then there's this other agenda possibly at play, and it it sort of in a certain sense undermines the primary function of of the situation. I think that's a problematic thing. It's just so fascinating to me seeing all of these scandals where we're, then we say, well, do no harm. 
but the the harm is difficult to quantify so one is asked in a certain sense as a one of these scan in you know, a scandal uh, ridden teachers maybe to do no harm without necessarily knowing what that is and especially when we change cultures as you say where different behaviors are interpreted in different ways it's just simply done very differently in different cultures so differently in fact that a compliment in this place is an insult in another it's very relative in that sense so you're yeah. you're suggesting perhaps to resort to workplace law and things like that as as, <laughs> as at least the bare minimum well yeah there's that but to me this is part of why you know i certainly don't have the answers to any of these things what i do think is important and this is sort of, you know, it seems like all my interviews, this ends up coming up at some point, is that people do their psychological work, that they keep working with um, with the personality patterning and trying to gain insight into that. I mean, everything is arising from the ground of being and seeing that there's some kind of, um, and trusting actually trusting that there's something optimizing about that. I mean, it's really hard in the world today, especially with the climate crisis and all that to see what could possibly be optimizing. Maybe humans aren't supposed to continue. Maybe that's what's most op optimizing for the earth. I don't know. But from that place of equanimity, all of this can be seen. And yet if we're going to live as humans, we have to deal with all these messy questions you're asking. You know, we can't just say, well, like I, Stephen told me that like in Zen, they used to think that like when you had an awakening, it just blew back all the personality material and then I'm not creating any karma anyway. So, you know, everything I'm doing is arising from the ground of being. So if I, what's arising is me having sex with a student, then it's all just arising from the ground of being. No. <laughs> Which, from a certain yeah. point of view, is 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 true, I suppose. It's, it is true. It is all true from a certain point of view. That's where it gets confusing. So is murder. So is murder. So uh, every horrific thing is all arising from the ground of being. So this is, to me, where the human experience is so fascinating. Because what does that mean as a human? If If I'm, to me, where I really see it is that, okay, so this is really what I, I saw... Um, let me hold something up. I'll use my coaster. Like, really, what I got with awakening was like, okay, what do you see here? This is not a trick question. If I had a piece of paper, I'd put it here. Okay, I see you holding a coaster in front of your hand. <laughs> four fingers. Oh, apart from that, yes. Also four yeah, fingers. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> Okay. I just failed the awakening yeah. test. Oh, no. Yeah. yeah. Well, no. Yeah. I mean, it was, I mean, if I had a piece of paper, this would have gone better. <laughs> But I mean, this, if one is really living from down here, we aren't really separate from another. And so to do harm to another, it, you have to be told, you have to be totally up here to be able to do, I mean, ending a relationship where it's over, that's one thing, but to do something that really like damages somebody, you have to not be connected to the part that is that person. You know what I mean? I do. So it's not a very good litmus test, but to me, that's really, um, that's the difficulty of being regular people out in the world with awakening is there's all these different, you know, potential pitfalls that can happen. And that's what's exciting about our era is that we now have psychology and we can try and actually work through this to continue the evolution of the human consciousness to a level where we can live from um, what we know at a deeper level. That's so fascinating. And I'm aware that we're out of time now. And I do appreciate you from your vantage point in terms of you know, all the deep practice you've done and the various accomplishments that we've touched on. I do appreciate you, your willingness to discuss these gray areas and, and so on. It's I think it's very, very interesting and unusual for people to be willing to, to do that so i appreciate that a great deal tina people can work with you one-on-one -on -one, uh, via skype they can uh, attend uh, your workshops that you do where's the best way for people to to contact you and you know is there any is there anything you'd like to say in in closing as we bring this to an end 
the the best places to look at my website, which is um, awakeningdharma.com. So awakening dharma, just those words dot com, and all of that is there. Um, and in closing, yeah, I just really want to um, encourage people to listen to their own um, enlightenment drive to whatever it is that's calling you to spiritual practice um, to really be in touch with that and to let it um, let it guide you because you know we're at a place in human evolution where we need um, a new level of consciousness and so many people are interested in awakening in the spiritual path that I think it's a prime time for us to see a real shift in humanity. That would be my hope. Tina, thank you. This has been fascinating and there's so much more we could discuss. Perhaps we'll do a, a part two in the future. Thank you so much for spending your time here. Thank you. It's been really interesting and I've really enjoyed getting to know you a little bit. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.